Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Alia Putri Nurfitriana, student of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Satewacana. I am delighted to welcome all of you to this virtual room set up for the International Conference with a topic entitled Opportunities of Legal Education in the International and Digital Environment Across National Borders and Jurisdiction. This international conference is organized to commemorate the 61st anniversary of our beloved Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Satewacana. As to make it easier for each of us in this international conference to follow the sequence of this international conference, please kindly let me read its rundown. So the first session is opening ceremony session. And then Dr. Jefferson Cameo as her LLM, the chairman of the 61st anniversary of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Satyawacana, will give his brief welcome remark and report of what the organizer of this international conference have been doing until this very moment to make this event comes to happen. Dr. Cameo will then say a grace to begin this international conference. And then a very short speech or introduction will be given by the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Satyawacana, Dr. Marihot Jan Peter Huta Julu SHM Hum. The Dean will also officially open the international conference. And then the next session is opening the session. So in this session, Professor David Price will give his presentation. And then Mr. Jonathan Moore, MA, will take his session after the completion of the presentation given by Professor David Price. To end the presentation from the panelists, Mr. Theo Francis Lita ISH LLM PhD will give his presentation before the end of the conference. And then moderator open the Q&A session, also closing statement for moderator. So the next session is documentation session. So in this session, we will announce 15, for, I mean 14 lucky particip participants to get a lucky prize. And the last is closing prayer. Now, it's the time for me to invite the chairman of the 61st anniversary of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Satyawacana, Dr. Jefferson Cameo as the LLM. He will give the welcome remark and report also grace to begin this international conference. Dr. Jefferson Cameo, please take your turn. Thank you, Alia. Professor David Price, thank you for uh, joining us. And also Mr. Jonathan Moore, thank you for uh, receiving our invitation to uh, contribute your expertise and knowledge for this very, very important topic. Uh, as the MC have just told us, this conference is uh, made, uh, organized in order to commemorate the 61st, 61. We have been around for 61 in this country uh, teaching law. Uh, so this is also the first international conference that uh, is organized by this faculty since uh, we have been around for uh, 61 years. So please forgive us if you find any things uh, inconvenience when we uh, run this conference from the beginning to the end. Uh, we have 303 participants registered for this conference. Uh, about 27 lecturers from around the country across the country from Sulawesi, Flores, Papua, and many from East Indonesia, uh, faculty of laws in the country, and also uh, some from Java. Uh, I think we also have a private company uh, international private companies such as Chevron, uh, the staff of Chevron, uh, Mr. Effendi Manurum is also participating in this conference. Um, welcome, Effendi. 
uh, and some lawyers as well uh, participate in this conference. Uh, before I take too much time for this uh, welcome remark, I think we should begin this conference and I will lead uh, this conference with a small prayer. So now I think we have to begin this conference with prayer. So dear guests, let us begin our conference today with a prayer. God of all creation, we come to you at the start of our international conference and we want to give thanks for our university, this wonderful institution of learning located in Salatiga, and in particular for our faculty of law. Lord, we thank you for the leadership of our faculty and for all those who are arranged and organized today's program. We pray for everyone who will take part in this conference and contribute with their expertise and knowledge. We also give thanks for all those who have registered to listen to our speakers as they share with us their knowledge on a variety of legal-based topics. Heavenly Father, we are aware that education is the cornerstone on which society depends. Because without it, we cannot function properly as human beings or as a nation. Help us today to open our minds or ears and to be receptive to what we hear so that we may benefit from all that is said. Lord, we are grateful that despite the COVID-19 pandemic, this conference has been able to take place with contributors joining us from several different countries. Because of modern technology, it is not restricted by international and domestic barriers. Lord bless us now as we unite in the first, in the thirst for knowledge and understanding. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Alia, thank you. I give you back the time. Thank you, Dr. Jefferson Cameo. It is now the Dean of the Faculty of Law's turn to deliver a few words and officially open this international conference. Please welcome Dr. Mariho Jan Peter Huta Julu as HM Hum. Thank you, Alia. Um, good afternoon, honorable speakers. Dr. Jefferson Camillo, my college, moderator, and all of our beloved students and participants. First of all, I would like to thank God for all of his blessings so that we can meet virtually in this international conference to celebrate the anniversary of Universitas Kristen Satyawacana Faculty of Law. I would also give my most sincere gratitude to our great speakers Professor David Price, Mr. Jonathan Moore, MA, and Mr. Theo Francis Litai, SH LLM, PhD, for their presence and, and willingness to become our source of knowledge here today. As for all of the participants, I am so pleased to welcome you into this international conference. I hope that by the end of this conference, even when, when it is held virtually and we cannot see each other due to the global pandemic of COVID-19, we will still be able to get the advantages and knowledge which must definitely be very useful for ourselves in the near future. 
As the Dean of Universitas Kristen Satewacanas Faculty of Law, I feel very honored to have the chance in delivering the opening speech for our first ever online international conference titled Opportunities of Legal Education in the International and Digital Environment Across National Borders and Jurisdiction. In this era, global perspective is an important thing that future leaders should master or at least become familiar with. Based on the topics which our speakers will deliver, I hope that we as a higher education institution may prepare for the challenges and also possibilities towards progressive digitalization in our scope of knowledge. Undeniably, I believe that it will change many aspects in our education process itself. Notably, law students need to also know how to adapt with the acceleration of changes in that condition. Aside from the rapid development of digitalization itself, another form of change we will surely need to prepare for ourselves. Hopefully, in such short notice, is the post-pandemic world itself. As a form of response, we will have to prepare for that scenario. Our sector of education, especially in legal education, will have to experience adjustment in order to suit the needs and importances which are present post-pandemic. Above all, I am optimistic that this conference will give us will give all of us the answer for those problems and equip us to face the future of legal education. I wish all of us a very successful conference and please, I do hope that all of you will enjoy the conference as well. Now, to end my speech, I would like to say once again, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Dean Dr. Marihojan Peter Huta Julu SHM Hum. Now, without further delay, please welcome Ms. Ninon Melati Yugra SHMH, the moderator of this international conference, to lead the conference. Uh, thank you, Alia. Once again, I want to welcome all the participants to the international conference to celebrate the anniversary of our beloved Faculty of Law, Uni, uh, Faculty of Law Universitas Kristen Satyawacana. My name is Ninon Melati Ugra, a lecturer uh, in the UKSW Faculty of Law. And also um, today, in this, it is my honor and my privilege to moderate the panel today. Our international conference has chosen the topic on the opportunities of legal education in the international and digital environment across national border and jurisdictions. I believe this is an interesting topic as, uh, as we will discuss about the future of legal education and how we will see the legal education universally throughout the distinguished perspective of our incredible speakers today. I welcome to three main speakers today, uh, Professor David Price, Jonathan Moore, MA, and also Theo Francis Litai, PhD. Thank you for being here today. Before we continue to uh, hear their remarks, uh, there are some information that I would like to inform that uh, our speakers will be given 20 minutes respectively to deliver their remarks. Also, we welcome the participants questions for our speakers and we invite you to use the chat feature in the Zoom meeting throughout the talk. Time will be, this, uh, time will be reserved at the end of the uh, presentation for our speakers to engage the questions. Without any intention to delay our next session further, I will introduce the first speaker. 
Professor David Price. He's a professor in public international law in the Asia Pacific College of Business Law, Business and Law at Charles Darwin University, Australia. He holds degrees in law as well as international relations, industry, history, and Chinese. His early research work has been on intellectual property regimes and their enforcement in the Arabian Gulf states, focusing on the intersection of the intellectual property law, public international law, and international trade agreements. David Price has worked consultant and research in institution in Australia, Indonesia, in the United Kingdom, Europe, China, and the Middle East. And he is also the member of Law Asia and a board member of the International Indonesia Foundation, the Northern Territory Council of Law Reporting, and Northern Territory Law Journal. He has held visiting professorships at university in Indonesia and China. That is a brief profile of our first speaker, Professor David Price. He will, uh, he will deliver his remarks with a topic on our new post-pandemic world, transnational law and legal education opportunities and challenges. So please, Professor David Price, have your time. Yeah, Professor David Price. Uh, you are still uh, muted. Yeah, we can see the PowerPoint, but we cannot still hear your voice. Please mute your audio first. Uh, good afternoon, yes. ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Yeah, clear. Right, I'll just put my PowerPoints onto presentation mode. First of all, Dr. Murray Hall, Dr. Jefferson, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in your 61st anniversary presentation. Um, I hope you can see my PowerPoints as I go through. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see my PowerPoints now, I'm afraid. I'm sorry to, to create this problem for you. But my screen appears to have gone dark. Yeah, we as well can see only the black uh, you can, screen. You, you can still see the PowerPoints though, can you? Yeah. But now All we good. can see the, uh, your last, your last uh, part, uh, slide. Okay, well, I'll work on, on this one. There seems to be an issue. But ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to have the opportunity to participate in your 61st anniversary celebrations. Um, the, the topic appeals to me and will show my bias as I go through the presentation, particularly when we're talking about the digital environment and across national borders and jurisdiction. And Jonathan, I was inspired by the notice on what you were going to talk about, that is transcultural um, perspective. So I simply had to produce something in respect of transnational law. So what I want to do, ladies and gentlemen, as my title suggests, is look briefly at the post-pandemic world as it relates to higher education, and then some of the challenges and opportunities. And I want to finish off by making a few remarks about the law degree program at Charles Darwin University, which happens to be delivered both live and in the digital environment that is online. So, and you'll have to make allowance for the fact of my age and I'm not an absolute technocrat. So let's start. This is what I propose to talk about. Now, please do come in and uh, remind me if I have made a technological error. First of all, let me talk about the new post-pandemic world. And I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But we've all had significant disruption globally throughout the world. Um, not only in Australia, of course, not only Indonesia, United States, Europe and elsewhere throughout the world. But we in Australia have suffered um, disruption, 
And I've listed some of the areas on that PowerPoint in front of you where that disruption has appeared, not only nationally in the economy and government revenue, particularly with small businesses, small and medium enterprises. Employment has been a real issue where a considerable number of people have lost their jobs because their businesses simply couldn't survive because of the uh, downturn in activity. Health, physical and mental, both have seen um, considerable um, disruption. Relationships, not only family, but communities, friends and so forth, <clears throat> have all experienced uh, concerns. And as far as Australia is concerned, travel restrictions, both domestically and internationally. One strategy which Australian, uh, gov Australian um, premiers utilised was to close their borders. So the people couldn't move from Victoria to New South Wales, for example, or from New South Wales to Queensland, all in an endeavour to do something about stopping this pandemic. Education was particularly uh, affected, both at the uh, higher education and the secondary and primary and even child minding areas, and domestic and international higher education in particular was also affected. But in some respects, we in Australia were fortunate. We were lucky, considerably lucky. Since the first case in January, we've had 27,000, almost 28,000 cases, most of which are now reported as having recovered. And we're very, very fortunate in only having 908 deaths. <clears throat> uh, and we were blessed in that sense, uh, particularly when we consider remind ourselves of the situation that has been occurring in the United States, where I believe they're getting close to the 300,000 mark. Almost 10 million tests have been conducted nationally, of which only 0.3% have been positive, and only 10 new cases in the last 24 hours. So I say again, we have, through sheer luck mainly, but also have effort, been rather fortunate. But nevertheless, we have experienced considerable disruption in our lives. I want to focus now on the impact when it comes to higher education. And there has been challenges for us. And it's been challenges in relation to primarily maintaining the health and safety of students and staff. That is both academic staff, and non academic administrative staff and casual staff. It has meant that we have had to fundamentally change our behaviour, as has occurred everywhere. The wearing of masks, the, the distancing uh, of ourselves from each other, from our colleagues. Um, why we behave ourselves social, no more handshakes, no more hugs, for example. Maintaining staffing and resourcing levels because of that, because incomes, university incomes have been declining. Students, in some respects, have decided to take a break from their studies or new students have decided not to enrol in this year because of the uncertainties. That's meant many universities in Australia have had to look at ways which they can save money. And as I'm sure you're all aware, in the university sector, the greatest single item expenditure is in staff costs. And many universities in Australia have had to reduce staff. This has meant changing the way we teach, changing our pedagogical practice, cancelling live classes has been the principal activity in that regard, and moving to other ways to deliver courses, and that is primarily online. Now, it's estimated that Australian universities will lose $16 billion over the next four years. In this year alone, they will lose between three and $4.8 billion. Some of that money will be met by the Australian government, but of course it has its own budget to repair and its own efforts that it's had to make to spread um, the downturn across the whole of the Australian economy. So for us, it has been a challenge nationally, but also in the higher education industry. <clears throat> but the area where um, universities have been hardest hit has been in international education. Now, at one stage, I say here on the slide, by the beginning of this year, Australia was prepared or close to becoming number two internationally in terms of higher education provision after the United States. 
but that's all changed. When the, uh, the COVID-19 came to the fore, the pandemic came to the fore, almost immediately international flights were stopped. Those international students who were already here were faced with the dilemma, do they stay or do they go home? For those who are coming in, if they could get a flight in, they, of course, had the issue of going into quarantine. And on the side in front of there, you can see that a significant number of students came to Australia, almost 480,000, mostly from the Asian region. Uh, and for some universities in Australia, the loss meant impact of over 40% of their, their um, budget, their income. And some Australian universities were warned many years ago when we started to go out to international education as an economic initiative, as distinct from an educative initiative, that they shouldn't rely too much on international income in case something happened. And that has come to show us the pandemic. This is something that has happened. Uh, <clears throat> now, what, does, what should we do? And I'll give you a comment there from Stephen Parker, who's a former vice chancellor of the University of Canberra and currently a special advisor of the KPMG on Australia. He said, we've been hit with this situation. We have to change. We have to do things differently, not only because of the pandemic, but also because if we go back to the old ways, well, other challenges will come to hit us. He sees the pandemic as something of a watershed. He sees it as a good reason, an imperative, if you like, for us to change in the way we transform and teach higher education. And he says the four areas in which we have to change. We're being forced to change by the pandemic. We're being forced to change by the impact of that in terms of, for example, how we teach. And he comes up with four areas. First of all, the farewell to the tedious lecture. The old fashioned live lecture, for example, should disappear. It should be re reformed. It should take in advantage of new technologies, particularly the digital technologies. It should move across national borders and it should look at moving across jurisdiction. There was still room for face to face, but it should no longer be the passive tedious lecture that existed when I was at university, where we talked or we heard an individual, a lecturer, talking to a blackboard. And this, you may think of this, talking to a blackboard. We saw the back of the head of the lecture with writing on a blackboard in chalk. That goes. He says also we should look at new markets, look at new associations. Um, we should not necessarily rely on the conventional international student markets. We should diversify from that. Australia has been relying on them for 30 years, uh, almost 40 years. And we should look at different ways of doing that. We should look at, for example, uh, to not relying on those countries who can afford international education at the economic prices we charge, but we should also look at providing international education to developing and least developed countries as well. In some respects, as a gesture towards a repeat business. He suggests we should look at reducing costs. No longer perhaps should we look at building extensive um, uh, monuments to our wealth in terms of enormous buildings on campus, but we should look at changing our balance sheet and making it more, um, more uh, suggestive and receptive to change. Uh, we should look at moving our funds into different areas to promote uh, education in the digital environment. And the other thing he suggests is we look at look who, who are the students of the future. And he said, again, there's a whole industry out there that perhaps we haven't tapped because it hasn't been convenient for us to do so. Uh, so there are some of the things he suggested that we have to do. But what he does say is that what we can't do is go back to the old ways. Otherwise, 
in the future, we could hit by another similar pandemic environment. Bill Gates, a little while ago, was asked for his views on, on um, the post-pandemic world. And one of the things he said was, next time it will be different because we won't be so stupid. In other words, we would have learnt from this, hopefully, and we will change. So let's return now to a little bit on the transnational legal environment and legal education. And if I talk about transnational legal environment, I've got to look at Philip Jessup, who's Professor of Law at Columbia University, a diplomat, a United Nations delegate, and the judge of the International Court of Justice. Now he's writing in 1956 or speaking in 1956 in what was known as the Storrs Lectures. Now I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with the name Philip Jessup because I know that Indonesian universities are very active when it comes to international muting. So you'll be familiar with what is perhaps arguably the largest international moot competition globally, and that's the Jessup moot. And for that, we owe thanks to Philip Jessup and his wise words. <laughs> he can claim credit, or we give him credit, for coming up with the term transnational law, rather than the old-fashioned term international law to distinguish between domestic law and other law. Transnational law. And he described it as law which regulates actions or events that transcend national frontiers. Both public and private international law are included, as are all other rules which do not wholly fit into such standard categories. And when I saw your sub-theme across national borders and jurisdiction, I immediately thought of Philip Jessup and his definition an introduction to the term transnational law all those years ago. I have on this slide further comments by him on transnational law, but I'm mindful of time. But I just want to take you to the third paragraph, the bottom paragraph, where he makes this very important point I consider. The choice in law, and we could change that to say, the choice in higher education and legal education need not be determined by territoriality, personality, nationality, domicile, jurisdiction, sovereignty, or any other rubric, save as these labels are reasonable reflections of human experience with the absolute and relative and of the forum. Now, he was talking about transnational law. We could apply apply his wise words, I would suggest, equally to legal, edu legal education. And that's how he saw the interaction of the, the well-established divisions between the major areas of law, that is public international law, private international law or the conflict of laws, and municipal law, that is domestic law. That's how he saw transnational law as being all of those but also something slightly different and more. But they all interwove, were all interwoven, and they all interleaved. Fairly recently, there's a response to the pandemic. The International Association of Law Schools did a report. And what they were looking at in their report, well, they're doing a report from two perspectives, from the faculty, the professors, and also from the student voice. And I'll look at the first report the faculty voice. Now, what they were doing in the report was looking at transitioning to online legal education as a consequence of the pandemic. And what would academic staff do? Now, from their report, they got these comments. And I think it's a very telling report because it does two things. It promotes or raises discussion on the, on the notion of change across national borders and jurisdiction and whether people will change. And they're two different issues. And in the report, they found that many believed online teaching was equally the same and it could be in certain cir circumstances more appropriate than face-to-face -face teaching. They found if some schools already had an online program, the transition to total online was not a great issue. It could be effortless. But for those schools who did not have 
online programs already and were teaching in the traditional face-to-face -face way, they struggled. They had concerns. They were not simply not prepared. So as a result of that experience, it was found that some were prepared to change. But they also found that many would revert to face-to-face, uh, -face, but perhaps online teaching would become part of a new curriculum of pedagogy. And what I've got here next is some comments that came from some of the contributors to this particular report. And it's interesting to note, first of all, uh, the conservatism that it does exist in the comments I've put up and where those reports or those comments came from. So we have, for example, I hope and pray that this pandemic will end and we can go back to our regular classes, a professor from Bangladesh. Others from Canada said, let us hope for a speedy return to in-person teaching. Or I think the purely online training with many hours is madness and against mental and even physical health. You can't do it for full-time students. Others were online teaching is good to help us explore technology, but cannot be taken as an alternative in class sessions. So on those four slides there, you are seeing a recognition in some respects that we have to participate for the time being in online teaching, that is in the digital environment, but perhaps we're going to be conservative and we're going to return to what we know best and what we're comfortable with. Others say that the, an online class is less interactive and students are only passive. Others say can only be supplementary, can only be subordinate. Online teaching can never replace classroom teaching. And I'll leave this with a, a comment from an Australian professor that the integration of online elements is a no-brainer. However, the notion that online teaching has advantages over personal contact is highly dubious. So here we have a range of comments, which I, which I read with some degree of disappointment, I must say, and indeed some alarm. Some are prepared to adopt, but others aren't and will probably revert. So that's what was being said by the staff uh, when it came from the report of the International Social Association of Law Schools. Their other part of the report, however, dealt with what students might say. And these have to be taken with a pinch of salt because they are comments from the students conveyed to the professors who professors are conveyed to the International Association. And in summary, and I've only done in summary, Teachers understand the need and convenience of online teaching currently due to our current times. Yet ultimately, the concluding agreement is to return to in-person teaching, especially to teach undergraduate students. Now, when I see those remarks, and I think of the comments by my earlier um, the professor from University of Canberra, I see a disjunct, a dichotomy between these remarks and the need for change, the need to react to this situation that we have to perhaps be prepared for further situations in the future. I also want you to remember those comments when I come to talk about what we are doing in our program, law program at CDU. I'm sorry, here are some of the remarks that have been paced, passed on from students to, to staff. And again, there is some satisfactory remarks in relation to teaching, but there still seems to be a certain hesitancy about, about uh, moving to an online environment. Although in the remarks, as you see in front of you, there are some that said, this is worth a try. The professor from Turkey says, it is more beneficial to meet face to face with students on online platform. We can communicate them with more easily and spare more time with them, thanks to the internet. A professor from Uganda, I have been able to provide more detailed resources. A professor from Chile, it has been a satisfactory experience, despite the fact that I did have lack of experience. And another from Kenya, remote teaching offers me better time management options. 
So here I'm starting to get a few comments that says, oh, I'm going to have a go at this and I might continue with this and try it later on. So let me move then, um, so I don't I go over time, onto some of the legal education opportunities and challenges as I see them. And in terms of challenges first, so I can finish on a positive note. First, we need commitment from senior management, commitment both in time, in terms of resources, particularly financial and teaching resources to be involved and be committed to having um, online teaching across national borders and jurisdiction as a primary pedagogical experience. It requires initial investment in the hardware and software, and it also requires ongoing maintenance in both hardware and software. It requires training for both presenters and students, and it also requires qualified support persons, technological support persons, to maintain and support both presenters and students. It requires connectivity of both provider and user sources, that is at the student end and also at the lecture end. Now, I have read that one way of providing user sources for the, the uh, students, and this has been done in the past in some American universities, is to provide students at the time they enrol with pre-programmed laptops so we know that they can get access with instructions on how to use both the software and the hardware. So there's some of the challenges, that it has to be a whole of institutional experience at all levels, that we are committed to going to online delivery. And I say in going to online delivery, that doesn't necessarily mean to also exclude the internal experience, the face-to-face -face experience. Both can exist at the same time. But let me talk about opportunities. If we break down and move outside the physical borders or the national borders that represents our country or our province, we're looking at possibility for new student markets. And that could be new student markets geographically. It could be new student markets socially. And it could be new student markets culturally. We can look at having establishing new markets in terms of <coughs> Uh, age groups, socioeconomic backgrounds, different countries and regions. And still, if we're very clever, we look at the possibility of moving outside on occasion where appropriate, the old standard of everything being done in English. So the possibility of new student marks could be very exciting. But we can find discovering new business partnerships. That could be delivery not only with business, domestic business, not only businesses which are associated with uh, the higher education industry, but businesses very diverse that's going to benefit from the training we do. And the new business partnerships could be international, that is new countries, but it also could be institutional, not only domestically, but also internationally. It also raised the possibility of a different sort of student. And I did ask a question before, uh, who are the students of the future? In view of the fact that the penetration of smartphones across the globe, and it's almost to the stage where every person in the world, number for number, has got a smartphone. It means really that we are not limited to what was conventionally the post-secondary student. It means we are opening up to a whole range of individuals, families, families studying as families, uh, those who have some streetwise experience under their belt, those who are established in their careers, or those who have always wanted to do law but have never been able to because of other imperatives and have done their bit getting close to retirement and saying, I want to now follow my dream. So a whole new market in terms of age distribution as well. The new collaborations, institutional. We can operate uh, together across our international boundaries institutionally at both the undergraduate level or the postgraduate level. 
or the research level. And to give you an example of that, I do have some PhD students from both um, Indonesia and Timor-Leste. I make a point that um, in setting up the supervision panel for those students, they will have uh, an associate supervisor from the area in which they're doing their PhD or from their home country. And it's always worked and it's worked well. And it's a story that I'm going to continue doing uh, with my limited future in research and higher education. Now, let me briefly end by talking about the CDU online law degree program. And this is probably a, a, a program with you're familiar with, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. It's got pretty wide international penetration. And that's the sort of screen that a student doing it online will have. And you can see the interaction. You can see the chat boxes down the right hand side. But this is our program. In 2002, Charles Darwin University was faced with its own sort of pandemic. That is, we're losing students because every other Australian university had a law degree. We were losing out because we were young. What did we do? What could we do? And we thought, tell you what, we'll go online. So we went online in 2003 and we were the first Australian university to offer a fully online um, law degree. It's a law degree that satisfies the requirements for admission of professional practice. And what it does is we offer simultaneous face-to-face -face and online, online interactive lectures and tutorials. So I will sit in the classroom and I will deliver to students who are facing me. And at the same time, I will have students online participating. And those students online can talk to me and can talk to the students in the classroom by this Blackboard technology. They can put up a chat box if they wish. On top of that, we have lectures and tutorials also recorded, both an MP3, that is audio, and MP4 video. And that means those lectures and tutorials and the material that's presented in those lectures and tutorials are available 24 seven. A lecture doesn't cease after an hour or two hours and a student will long on memory, both internal and online students can access those lectures 24 seven. Now, this is the interesting bit. 80% of our law students are online. They opt to study online. And there's free movement between face-to-face -face and online. If an online student happens to visit Darwin, they can come into the lecture room. If an internal face-to-face -face student has got some other commitment, they can go to the lectures that are recorded and so forth. And who are those students? Now, we're in Darwin down at the waterfront. Those who are resident in Darwin, who are in full-time employment, who have got other commitments, go online. They come into the classroom when they want to. Those in remote territory locations, those interstate and overseas, school leavers, those already in employment, career changes and retirees, or those with families. Now, CDU, for that reason, scores highest amongst all Australian universities when it comes to graduate em employment after completion of the degree. And also, as a consequence, our law enrolments increased during 2020. Now, you may recall comments made during the um, International Association of Law Schools report that online students feel disenfranchised. They feel they don't have any contact they feel remote. My experience since 2003 is just quite the contrary. Because students are interacting in the digital environment and the digital environment is open 24 seven, they will contact me 24 seven. I will get emails from them on Sundays, on the weekends. I will get emails from them. They send them to me at 2 a.m. in the morning and I can respond what I want. So instead of, as with an internal lecture, the interaction with the lecturer is five minutes before the lecture till 10 minutes after the lecture. And perhaps if you go to the lecturer's uh, office for some reason, with online students, with the social media and the digital environment being open 24 seven, 
the interaction potentially could be over that same period. So the students, we, we bond. We bond with the students. They know us, we know them. If we decide to interact on video with visual, we get to know them. We know what they look like, they know what we do. And of course, utilizing social media, they go to a lot of trouble to find out what else we do by searching for us online. I'll just pass over that. I just wanted to show you this last slide, which shows you over the last couple of years where my students have lived who are doing my unit LWA321 Public International Law. They come from all over the seas. I've had students in Japan, and this over only three years, students in Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, Germany, UK, the Middle East, in both uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai and Oman, South Africa and the United States. Now, it means that those students sometimes have to get up at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. to come into the lecture if they want to do it live. And in fact, they do. And they interact. And they, we interact back with them and we're committed. So that's just a snapshot of where these students come from. And I must stress that these are domestic Australians who are Australian expatriates overseas who want to do something because perhaps their spouse is the one who has the employment contract and they have spare time in their hands or they want to keep in touch with Australia and what's happening in Australia and one way of doing that is by doing a degree online. So in some respects, my, my uh, experience with online education across national borders and jurisdictions has been a positive one. Now, I've maintained associations when those students have studied online with me over the years, as well as those who have done face to face. In closing, I do stress the two have equal advantage and are both worth pursuing. One shouldn't necessarily be given prominence over the other. They are both very valuable. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I think is quite enough for me. I thank you very much again for the opportunity to participate. I hope you found my few comments, even though it's shown my bias for uh, online education, but I hope you've it's, uh, given you food for thought. At that point, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you, Professor David Price. From what you have, uh, what you have explained, uh, I can see that um, indeed the pandemic has affected a lot of uh, sectors, including the educations, and based on what you have explained, that we cannot change, uh, we cannot avoid the changes itself. So, what we have to do is that we have to adapt to uh, the changes and uh, see that the pandemic is not. Um, I can say that uh, we can see that the pandemic can be a blessing for us too if we. Uh, take the perspective, the positive perspective that you have explained uh, that we have to adapt uh, from offline teaching to online teaching. So I think that's a very, very meaningful explanation that you have given to us. And re uh, talking about the international Philip G. Zabmut card, I remember that the Faculty of Law UKSW, the UKSW Faculty of Law, uh, has a history in the past. I think it, it was about in uh, 2012, I think so. Uh, this faculty has a uh, history in participating uh, that uh, that competition, and I think and it, it it was a quite hard <laughs> competition that <laughs> maybe the law students <laughs> may, uh, my experience. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor David Price. And uh, next, I will introduce you to our second speaker. Uh, he is a Jonathan Moore MA. So I will I will give a brief pro CV profile about our second speaker. So Jonathan Moore is an international instructor of literature, language and culture with over 20 years of experience teaching at colleagues and universities in the United States, Africa and Asia. His research interests include post neo and colonial literary studies, transculturalism, globalization and globalization, as well as interdisciplinary pedagogy and critical thinking. He has both an undergraduate and graduate degree from Eastern Illinois University and postgraduate training uh, in Seattle University. He has lived in uh, Indonesia for the past 13 years and currently teaches at Satyawacana Christian University. 
And today he will bring uh, the topic on a new legal world needs a new perspective, the value of transcultural and interdisciplinary students. And we are ready to hear your insight. Please, uh, Mr. Jonathan Moore, you have in about 20 minutes. Um, all right, I'm assuming that you can see my PowerPoint at this point. Um, similar to Dr. Price, um, I'm coming at this as kind of a technological newbie um, and maybe not quite the experience that you've got on it. Um, traditionally, one of the ways that you start a presentation is that you're told that you're supposed to start, a, start with a joke. And so a priest, a rabbi, and an imam walk into a, wait, that's not something that we can really tell here. This is a problematic situation, even by starting a joke like that. When we look at the fact that, is it funny? Is it offensive? Is it even legal to go ahead and make a joke like that in this kind of an audience in which we're dealing with several hundred students? We've got faculty members from this department as well as others. We've got members of the business community ranged in a variety of cultural backgrounds. This is a problem. So instead, so we've got an Australian law professor, an American lit and cultural teacher, a big group of Indonesian college students and business leaders from throughout the world. This is what we're gonna be focusing on is the fact that we're no longer dealing with a targeted audience in which you can affect change simply by looking at a, homo a, a homogenous group of people knowing what the expectations are and what the behaviors should be. Um, I wanna thank you for welcoming me here as being the non-lawyer of the group, although I grew up in a law family. Um, I appreciate the fact that I, I'm having a chance to explain some broader things that um, Dr. Price was really able to kind of um, lead into and I can bounce off of some of his ideas. Um, what I'm used to dealing with is the, these issues of transculturalism, these issues of thinking outside the box these ideas that just because you're an English major or you're a law student doesn't mean that the only thing you need to study to be an effective leader um, in your professional field is that place that you got your degree from. So the title of my presentation is that a new legal world needs a new perspective, the value of transcultural and interdisciplinary students. So depending on your background, we may be coming across some terms that you're not familiar with. So a lot of the ideas that I'm gonna be speaking of are going to be pretty broad. Um, I wanna give you some basic tools to work off of um, to begin to understand that not just with the pandemic, but with changes that we've been seeing um, throughout the time that even what my generation referred to as new media, um, this invention of the internet from when I was back at university, this, these are the changes that we're going to be talking about and how we've got a different kind of global environment to be dealing with and specifically law students themselves need to be aware of this. Thankfully, they're already in a spot um, ready for these changes and these challenges. So just as a starting point, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that we've all got this basic perspective on when we talk about culture. This is a definition that Long Crowell, an academic from the United States uses, and it's one of any dozen that we could be talking about. But instead, um, we're just gonna walk through some of these basic things so that we can understand when we talk about culture, we're talking about shared, and that's a key word to discuss here, shared symbols. We're talking about shared language. When we talk about language, we're not just talking about formal bahasa but we can be talking about things like body language. We can talk, be discussing things like jargon, um, specialized language used by um, a particular field or even a microcultural group. The inside jokes that you and your friends from your coasts talk about can be considered language. Um, certainly we could be talking about slang or gaul or any of those variations of language that separate generations because of the way that they use the formal language we need to talk about shared values. We need to talk about what's important to a community or a group of individuals. And then of course, we need to talk about norms. Um, normally when I start talking about this, we divide these norms into formal codified norms. You guys would refer to them as laws. And we can also refer to them as 
those things that you get you a dirty look from somebody in your church or your mother or your father kind of give you the indication of just wait until we get home because you're going to be in trouble for doing that in public. We've got those informal indications of behaviors that are accepted or not accepted. Um, we could talk about this in terms of language and manners of interacting and thoughts, um, values, expected behaviors, practices, this whole circle of ideas is what we loosely define as culture. And culture serves a very important function because in short terms, culture is the way that a group sees the world. It's the way that they look out at things. Um, it's the way that we prioritize. It's the way that we judge. It's the way that we communicate what's important to us and what's not important to us. These are the lenses that we see everything, law included, through. That's great. And it seems like a pretty easy notion to go ahead and take a National Geographic perspective and narrow in on one group of people and start seeing things as this is a static definition. We could look at the Javanese or we could look at the Americans or we could look at the Australians and say that this is what they believe. This is how they see the world. It's a very comforting kind of idea. If it was true, it would be comforting. If it was accurate, that would be great. But the fact is that culture is not static. And especially in this globalized society that we're living in, that's constantly changing thanks to social media and the internet, that more than ever, culture continues to change at an alarming rate. It mutates. Culture changes and develops. Um, if we had six to eight weeks to go over this, we could talk about the different dynamics of culture. We can talk about the way that things change, um, how if you institute just a small change in one aspect of culture, that can have that rippling effect to affect other aspects of culture. Um, we begin to go ahead and see that um, the internet and avatars and online class behavior are constantly in a state of flux. Back in February, we had an idea about this is how we're going to start dealing with online classes. But any online teacher here could tell you that their first few weeks of online teaching looks very different than their more recent time online. Ideas that they thought were going to work, behaviors that you, they thought they were going to be receiving from their students change dramatically. Culture is increasingly borderless because of not only the online perspective, in which you can have students who are from Central Java, but quickly become fanatics of K-pop or interested in African tribal music or decide what they really wanna do is study French cuisine, the way that French cuisine was made to be eaten and cooked. Getting online and looking at YouTube tutorials allow them to indulge in this cultural exchange, even if they're never able to leave their hometown or their home village. Um, I grew up in the Desa. I grew up in the small, small town in central Illinois where I had nothing ranging, or nothing close to cultural diversity at all. We thought that it was unique that we had one Catholic at our school, but that was a shocking cultural diversity situation. And I fell in love with African literature. It was something that I was able to go ahead and engage in and let my mind really um, explore. Increasingly, people are borderless in terms of their interests. We change who we are and the way that we see the world with each one of these um, interactions, with each one of these cultural connections. And our culture taken back with us on an individual basis changes as well. As Uka Aswe looks to see how other universities are handling the pandemic and how they're handling online learning, we're learning. We're figuring out what's going to work for us and what's not going to work for us. We're looking at our student body population and seeing who they are, what their immediate beliefs and values and attitudes are. And we're looking at the world's beliefs, values, and attitudes, these universities that we're modeling our paradigm off of. And we're seeing some of these ideas are going to work, but some of these ideas are definitely not going to work. Culture changes. And because of that, we need to be willing to change as well. Mutation isn't bad. I think that we need to understand that. 
um, several years ago down at Petra University, I, I gave a presentation and it wasn't without controversy, but I talked about the myth of static culture because I think a lot of leaders want to maintain our cultural values. It's comforting to know that things are the way that things used to be. But these changes, these adaptations to our environment, be it because of pandemic or because K-pop suddenly makes a big splash um, on television and the internet, these changes can be good. Multiple cultural identities is one of the things that we see sprouting out of these cultural changes. Um, if I ask you, who are you, culturally speaking? A lot of us would choose our passport country. We would go ahead and say that I'm an American. But at the same time, it goes beyond that. Maybe you identify more um, as, a, as an ethnic group than you do as a national identity. Many Americans identify themselves as hyphenated Americans. Well, I'm an Irish American. Showing the importance of that other cultural identity. But if we take that broader cultural identity and we begin to shrink it down, we start looking at the number of micro cultures that you're part of, the differing groups, the people that you relate to. And the easy things are things like religion. Okay, we can talk about the fact that regardless of where you're from, if you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu, you can look at other places in the world and see similarities of people practicing that religion. But there are still differences. And so now you happen to be your passport country as a cultural identity, but you've also got this religious identity. And then think about your hobbies and, your, and the things that you are a fan of and what you do with your time. And sometimes even within those groups, we can identify cultural characteristics that a fan of Manchester United has a certain belief system that may be different than a fan from a different football club. Um, those microcultural identities have priorities. They've got beliefs, they've got attitudes, they have slang or jargon that they use. And for that reason, we're now seeing the world not just through one lens. Um, several years ago, I think I was turning 30, I went to the eye doctor because of these headaches that I was having. And the doctor said, yep, sure enough, you're too young for them, but you need trifocals. And so since that time, my eyeglasses have consisted of three different kinds of lenses. Each way that I tilt my head, I see the world in a slightly different way. This is a valuable thing, that you're not limited to one single perspective if you're able to have these multiple cultural identities. You can accept the cultural differences, but see the world differently. Eventually, you might lead to something that we refer to as a cultural duality, a balance in which you do view yourself as an Indonesian. But maybe, maybe after several years of studying abroad, you also view yourself as an Australian in many ways, or as an American or Singaporean. This cultural duality, this balancing act between different beliefs, values, and attitudes is something that's rarely achieved in perfect balance. But for many people, especially as you spend more time abroad or more engagement with that second cultural identity, you find more of a balancing act. More often, there's a term that I want us to kind of explore. We talk about third culturalism. Usually what happens, and in more recent anthropological studies, more recent studies that focus on cultural identities, especially among people living abroad, we talk about the fact that they identify themselves as neither the first culture or that second culture. Instead, they're a cultural other. My son was just over one year old when he left his first other home. He spent time in the United States. He spent time in Africa. And then for the last 13 years, he's been living here in Indonesia. And his beliefs have been shaped by all three of those national identities. But when he goes to the United States, he isn't truly an American anymore. He takes his shoes off before he enters the house. He knows that every good meal has to have rice with it or it's not really a meal. He understands the idea of tolerancy and doesn't understand American gun culture at all. His identity in the United States is not one of an American in the same way that an American who was born and lives there permanently is. But at the same time, walking around Salatiga, 
he's quick to acknowledge that he is not an Indonesian either. That there are key differences when you see this long haired, two meter tall kid walking down the street to Mountain View. You immediately realize the fact that he's not one of them or one of us. He's different. He speaks some Indonesian, but he doesn't sound like an Indonesian. He sees the world through Indonesian eyes, but not completely. He's not an American, he's not an Indonesian. And as much as I wish it was the case, he's not an African either. He doesn't identify completely with all of those things, but that's a positive. The fact that he's able to go ahead and move through those ideas, because if you can move from one cultural identity to another cultural identity, and do so critically, aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it, we refer to that term as code switching. The idea that you know that if you run into me, you should speak to me in English because my Indonesian is weak, but you know my Javanese is not gonna get you anywhere whatsoever. And so you, need, so you switch into those ideas, but it's not just about language. Code switching when it's done effectively is about understanding your circumstances and realizing that there's a time for certain behaviors and a time in which those behaviors need to be changed. You don't speak to your mother or your father the same way that you speak to your children or your best friends. The attitudes that you take and the behavioral norms that are accepted in those situations are different. You know that you wear your batik for certain times and that you should wear your dress Western clothes for others. And sometimes you blend the two. I put on my batik shirt, my batik tie, along with my traditional Western blue shirt to go ahead and give me that balance of a little bit of Indonesian and a little bit of Americanness to go ahead and increase my level of ethos or credibility while I speak to you about this subject. This is what we're doing when we talk about transculturalism. We're talking about the ability to move from one cultural group, ideally smoothly, to another cultural group. We bounce back and forth there. Um, I wanna take this idea of, of multiculturalism and transculturalism, and I wanna start playing with it from a, an educational perspective. The traditional educational perspective, at least years ago, was that each major pairs you for a specific career. That if you enter into a program, that it's going to set you up for a certain number of jobs and a certain type of professional outcomes. The course of the study is narrowly defined. It operates off the premise that the best way to study a subject is to study that subject. How do you master law? You grab a law book and you learn everything that you can about law. You listen to the speeches, you listen to um, the court documents, you go ahead and read through those things. Maybe you get around to watching Citizen Kane or going ahead and watching To Kill a Mockingbird and you see what the, the American dramatic version of law is. But the focus of your studies is that subject and it's narrowly defined. But that's a linear way of seeing this because I think that anybody who's at a conference like this would acknowledge that the law isn't just about studying laws. Law study goes way beyond that. If culture is changing, then education needs to change too. And this is something that in the last few years, Ukaz Wei has been doing a really strong um, has really been doing a, a strong case for. They've been making a good argument for the idea of the liberal arts. Um, I am biased on this. Um, I came out of a liberal arts environment. I came from a family in which big ideas were talked about um, at the dinner table. Um, and I taught at liberal arts colleges, even the University of Asmara, um, where I taught in North Africa, was looking towards the, the value of this liberal arts education. But it's not a new term. The classical version of the liberal arts education focuses on the, the, the trivium and the quadrivium, the idea of studying grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and then geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, and music. Through a liberal arts education, the idea was that you would be a balanced human being, that you would be able to, like transculturalism allows, see the world through many different eyes. Some of us would look at these subjects and say, that's, they're separate, they're different, but they're not. They play off of and build off of each other. Um, the modern liberal arts education focuses on a balance of the sciences, the arts, and the humanities, with the expectation that students wouldn't just study one field, but would study several of them. 
my first teaching job in the United States was at a historically um, liberal arts college of only 500 students. But years before I had arrived, they had a program in which students had to choose a major and a minor. Now the natural inclination for students choosing a minor would be to find something close to their field. But Eureka College didn't allow for that. Eureka College said that if you were an English major, your minor had to be in one of the sciences or one of the other fields. It couldn't be related to English. Again, the idea was to give you a balanced education, allowing you to see both the mathematical and maybe the artistic, to be able to see the world in these differing perspectives so you weren't limited to that one focus. Liberal arts really is interdisciplinary studies. The idea of using more than one discipline to focus on and to learn from in order to go ahead and come up with bigger answers. Interdisciplinary studies crosses academic boundaries. It allows students to code switch ideas. And what I've just done right there is interdisciplinary studies. I've taught, used an anthropological term of code switching, and I've started to talk about that in terms of education and in terms of law. Code switching isn't just about cultural movement from one idea to another, but it can also be used in terms of speaking about academics. So you take an idea that you learned about in psychology, and we do this a lot in the English department. So you take a, 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 a psychological term and you start playing with it. And you start looking at Shakespeare, or you look at Hemingway, or you look at Ngugi Wa Thiongo, and you start seeing where does this idea that Freud or um, any number of other psychological greats, where does this come into play with literature? And how can we view literature differently? Marxism, college students love to take Marxism and play with Marxism and literature. Because the idea of power and balance plays out well when you read people like Dickens or when you read Dostoevsky or one of the great Russian authors. Playing with those mathematical ideas or those economic ideas or those political ideas or psychological ideas, you can do so many things with that that simply taking a look at plot and character and setting doesn't give you. In Advancing Interdisciplinary Studies, published in 1997, Klein and Newell argue the fact that there are just simply some ideas that are too broad or too complex for one discipline. When the United States launched the Apollo program, let's put men into space and let's land them on the moon. At its peak, there were over 400,000 people employed on that one issue, that one problem of how do we pe bring people into space and bring them back alive. And it wasn't just mathematicians or astronomers. It was things like dietitians. It were people that studied human involvement and interaction. If we send people to Mars and it takes them 50 years, people can't even tolerate their roommate for a couple of nights at a hotel at some academic conferences. Imagine what challenge you need to overcome in terms of personal dynamics just to be able to send people at that long of a voyage. Big problems require big solutions and it requires thinking beyond one discipline and seeing in the world. What does this have to do with law students? Again, I don't want to pretend that I'm the expert on this field. I want to go ahead and, and um, acknowledge that that's my 20 minutes, but I want to go ahead and give, give you a little bit more time. Um, I apologize for that. Um, what does this have to do with law students? Just looking at some basic things provided by the, the Law Student Council. Um, 145 different majors in the United States were accepted in, into American Bar Association accredited law schools from 2016 to 2018. 145 different fields went into law school. Greek and Latin majors, not pre-law majors, consistently score the highest on the law, on the law student exam. Pre-law majors are the least likely to be admitted into law school in the United States. That's according to the US News and World Report from a study that they did back in 2011 and 2012. And now I certainly don't wanna criticize undergraduate law programs, but what I think that these numbers begin to show is the fact that at least in the United States, they're looking for lawyers who are coming from different backgrounds. Good law programs anywhere in the world are going to give you these multiple perspectives. And I think that that's what the law programs 
especially at the graduate level, are really interested in because laws are changing and laws are developing and people are specializing. It's increasingly transcultural and interdisciplinary. There are over 100 different LLM and post JD graduate specializations in the United States. If you look at the list that the, the American Bar Association has come up with, you find really unique specialization, Native American law, sports gambling law focuses for the LLM. You see people who are focusing on homeschooling or home births. There's a huge variety of law that is simply too complex to look at it from a specialized perspective if you're just coming at it from one angle. You need these multiple ongoing differing perspectives. There are over 75 US study programs for um, foreign lawyers and foreign law students. There's a huge range of what they're offering and what they're trying to teach. My whole perspective on this presentation is to make an argument for the fact that we need, a in a transcultural world, we need interdisciplinary studies. We need people who are already moving from one cultural identity to another to have the tools that come with interdisciplinary studies. A law student that can move through those borders and use a variety of tools from those varieties of disciplines can address and resolve conflict more effectively. Again, I want to thank you for inviting me. Um, I appreciate um, you letting the non-law person speak his piece a little bit here. And um, I look forward to hearing after one more presentation, um, any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jonathan Moore, for your explanation. I see that there, there are so much to dig into uh, this topic. And what I, uh, what I have uh, learned from what you have explained is that uh, you, you concern on the culture, uh, on the culture issue that uh, this culture is dynamic and it can't uh, bring significant change to the, to the society and one of the one of the profits that to make them feel borderless. I think this is a good statement. And also when you state that um, when you stated that the mutation is not bad and you uh, and you can make a uh, and you can connect it to the trends what you call transculturalism where uh, there is the move from one to another culture uh, and then you can what well, I can conclude from what I have explained is that actually, the diversity can help us how to adapt to the to the new situation. I think that's a great point from what you uh, what you uh, what you have explained. So thank you very much uh, for your explanation, Jonathan Moore. And now we will continue to our third uh, speaker, whom I believe that most uh, our students are familiar with. <laughs> he is Theo Francis Litai, SH LLM PhD. So Theo Francis is a lecturer at UKSV Faculty of Law. He pursued his undergraduate program at UKS Faculty of Law, and he has a graduate degree from Freya University in Amsterdam. Also, he obtained his PhD from Faculty of Law, Education, Business and Art at Charles Darwin University. He has mediated certification from Arizona State University, and in the past, he gained fellowships from Ateneo de Manila University and Valparaiso University in the United States. And from 2015 to 2019, he was a senior advisor at the executive, uh, at the executive office of the president. And for today, he will deliver the topic on the complexity of regulation making during global pandemic and the use of international technology. So for Theo Francis Litai, please have your time. Hi, uh, thank you Ibn Inon for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, Hello, Professor Price and uh, uh, Jonathan Moore, uh, Marihot, Jefferson. Terima kasih untuk kesempatan ini. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss uh, the issues of uh, law, pandemics, and also how the role of uh, 
education sector uh, dealing with the challenges uh, faced by the universities, especially in Indonesia. So uh, as uh, the only Indonesian speaker today and also uh, a lawyer, I want to discuss uh, first about the legal issues uh, facing by uh, the country uh, during pandemic and how we use the information technology to deal with the issue. And at the end, I, I will come to uh, meet with the idea of Professor Price and also uh, Jonathan Moore uh, uh, regarding the importance of uh, international collaboration and cooperation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the 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 title of my handout is actually uh, is uh, the complexity of regulation making during global pandemic and the use of information technology. What is the role of legal education sector? Um, first, I want to start with a case study on the issue of uh, formation of law in Indonesia. Uh, there are two main actors uh, during the formation of law in Indonesia, uh, namely the executive branch of power, the government uh, led by the president, and the leg uh, legislative branch of power, uh, the parliament uh, consists of uh, House of Representatives and uh, regional representative body, uh, DPR and DPD. Uh, there are five stages in the formation of statutory regulation, which include uh, the stages of planning, uh, drafting, discussing, uh, ratifying, or stipulating, and enacting. Uh, formation of laws or formation of legislative products in Indonesia based on law number 12, 2011, conducted under the principles of the formation of good laws and regulations, namely uh, clarity of purpose, appropriate forming institutions or, or officials, suitability between types, hierarchy and content, implementability of a piece of uh, legislation, efficiency and uh, effectivity, clarity of formulation and openness. The principle of openness is carried out through the publication of the draft law, which can be accessed by the public. Openness is a manifestation of the implementation of good government governance. Um, talking about the hierarchy of legislation, there are types and hierarchy of legislations in Indonesia, consist of the constitution of the republic, uh, decree of the People's Consultative Assembly, uh, the so-called undang-undang or laws, or government regulations in lieu of laws or peraturan pemerintah pengganti undang-undang or perpu, government regulation, peraturan pemerintah, presidential decree, peraturan presiden, provincial regulation, regency and si or city regional regulation. Article 8 of law number 12, 2011 also provide more provision, more provision regarding other types of regulation that in line with the above mentioned hierarchy. Uh, generally speaking, planning of the draft law includes the following activities. Uh, first is academic draft preparation, uh, continue with uh, medium term national legislation program preparation, or we call it uh, PROLEGNAS, Program Legislasi Nasional, and preparation of annual uh, priority PROLEGNAS. In order to get input from the public, both the <coughs> uh, midterm PROLEGNAS and the annual priority PROLEGNAS, uh, the legislation body of, of uh, legislation body is uh, is a tool of the parliament uh, that will uh, that will uh, prepare the discussion of uh, any uh, bill that uh, submitted to the parliament uh, by either by the government, the House of Representatives, 
or uh, by the uh, regional uh, representative body. The legislation body announces the pla plans for the preparation of the prolegnas to the public through media, both printed and electronic, conducting uh, work visits to absorb the aspiration of the community and receive input in legislation body meetings. Public input is conveyed directly or by letter to the head of the legislative body before discussing the uh, prolegnas draft. Uh, from the time of dra dra drafting until after it is uh, stipulated, the parliament and the government, which is coordinated by the legislation body, disseminate the prolegnas to the public. Dissemination during preparation is carried out to provide information or obtain input from the public and stakeholders. The next uh, phase of uh, uh, law formation in uh, the parliament is uh, planning the uh, planning for the preparation of an open cumulative draft law. An open cumulative uh, list consisting of uh, ratification of certain certain international treaties or uh, a draft as a result of the decision of the constitutional court that mandate the parliament to uh, to follow up with a uh, piece of legislation or regarding the state budget or regarding the establishment expansion and merger of, of provincial and uh, local regions and also the enactment and revocation of government regulation in lieu of law and planning the preparation of a draft law outside the national uh, legislation program. During the discussion of the uh, bill, the draft law, the DPR and the government disseminate the bill to provide information and or obtain input from the public, as I mentioned before, uh, and from also from the stakeholders through electronic and or printed media. The public can provide input orally and or in writing to the parliament. In the event that the input is submitted verbally, it is carried by uh, carried out by public hearings, meetings with the head of the commission, the chair of the joint commission, the head of the special committee, the head of the legislative body, or the head of the budget committee. That's the story about the legislation process in Indonesian parliament uh, together with the government. The challenge we are facing now is global pandemic of COVID-19. 10 months ago, no country in the world expected that human life in this earth would undergo a very drastic dramatic change due to the global pandemic COVID-19 caused by the, corona, the new coronavirus. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, high world economic growth had caused the movement of people and goods across borders to occur on a global scale. On the one hand, it is positive for the advancement of world trade. But on the other hand, there is a risk of transferring viruses, pests, and bacteria in a short time and in large numbers. That's why the issue of biosecurity is also very important in the modern world. Even, be, even before the, even prior to the uh, global pandemic. The global pandemic, uh, in my opinion, is an emergency for many countries that have drastically changed human life across the globe. All countries suddenly have to change their government activities, development activities, and answer various problems that arise suddenly. This including changing the patterns of public involvement in drafting laws and regulations. In this case, the use of information technology is very important to replace the previous uh, forms of uh, Public, public consultation. 
um, direct public consultation during the pandemic, during uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's not easy to carry out. Even uh, it's uh, canceled in, in, uh, in many, uh, in many of the of, of the schedule, yeah. Trips to the regions by members of parliaments are also not possible uh, because of the uh, limiting of uh, social uh, activities, uh, especially uh, during uh, April to uh, August. Uh, hence, communication through the use of the internet becomes important. I think this is where the role of universities that are more familiar with the use of information technology nationally and internationally. They can play a role in helping the community as communication bridge and even being a mouthpiece of public opinion in drafting a bill. Cross-border collaboration, conferences, discussions are also available by internet during this pandemic. Indonesian government introduced the concept of Campus Merdeka or Merdeka Belajar. Yeah. Um, freedom Campus or Freedom Learning that uh, promote flexibility, cross-campus collaboration because uh, students, uh, many of the students decide to go back to their uh, hometown and uh, taking course online and so cross campus collaboration is one of the idea credit taking cross regions is also introduced and uh, promoted by the government and promote internship including the online mode and they open the opportunity for stronger international cooperation including the opening of foreign campus in indonesia as we know the Monas University designed a new uh, branch of campus in uh, BSD Tangerang near Jakarta. So um, we are facing the uh, uh, difficulties during uh, this pandemic, but using the technology and also uh, strengthening our uh, collaboration and our cooperation i think we can we can improve uh, uh, the quality of uh, our activities including the the quality of uh, law making process in indonesia uh, ibu nino that's all uh, from me for now as the introduction for our discussion and uh, thank you very much for your attention Thank you so much, uh, Theo, uh, Theo Francis Lydia, for the knowledge. Uh, I have learned that uh, you observed uh, the issue based uh, from the regulation making perspective that uh, that the pandemic has changed how the government uh, create uh, cr uh, what the create the methods for some procedures to uh, to make the regulation. So I think this is uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, knowledge. I think. For, for the law students and thank you for that, for sharing your knowledge. And now uh, we are moving to the Q&A session. So I have seen, uh, I have write some questions in the chat, uh, in the chat feature. So uh, for the Q&A session, I will read the question for the speaker. So, and then after reading the chat and then I will give uh, the speakers uh, time to respond to the questions. And uh, from what I see here, uh, there are four questions in total. So the first one is for, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, um, I need to scrolling up. Right, this is for Fred, uh, this question is from Fredelino de Sousa. Oh, this is the alumni of OKS Will of Students. Um, he's a lawyer now, and he would like to ask for, uh, Professor David Price. As for your presentation, you say that in higher education, the model of learning has changed as well from on, offline to online, caused by this COVID pandemic. 
Do you agree that this new model of learning, particularly in law faculty, as a signal of decoupling times that in the nearest future, the mindset of lawyer and jurist will be changed? So that's the question for Professor David Price. And then the next one is the question for Mr. Jonathan Moore from Rainer Sebastian. So Rainer Sebastian is the student of our, uh, is our student. Uh, he said that I do agree with Mr. Jonathan Moore about mutation and attitude that we must have. But nowadays, from what I see in my own country, Indonesia, still so many people do struggle with the culture uh, mutation that have big enough impact to how people's attitudes. So to Mr. Jonathan Moore, how is your opinion to control the mutation so it will not become bad mutation. And then the next question is again for uh, Mr. Moore. It is from Denny Persa Perdana Samosir. I would like to ask about how some, stu uh, some students need to be productive during this pandemic because I have experienced that lots of students do not like this kind of learning. So do you have any idea or motivation for those who think that they have lost their dreams and passion during this pandemic. And also, this is the question from our community head uh, by Jefferson Gameo. The question is to Professor David Price and also Mr. Moore. My concern is probably on the culture as an ex-law student and now teacher of law. In law, we learned that the law must not change. The law must always supreme and absolute. But at the same time, lawyers and especially law students must adopt to new culture, especially in this case, the digital environment. Do, uh, so do we, the law student and their teachers need to change? For example, changing the principle in law that a buyer must uh, pay to another new principle that uh, to adopt the changing housing by this new trend in technology. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that's uh, the question for uh, Professor David Price and uh, Mr. Jonathan Moore. So I would like to give uh, the first opportunity for Professor David Price to give uh, your response. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Well, let me direct, first of all, the question from Freddie D'Souza about the decoupling of, of time uh, and will the mindset of the law induced also change? Um, and I'm going to sit on the fence and say yes or no. In the domestic context, maybe there will not be change in time uh, or decoupling of time, but the, it is becoming lesser and less possible to act entirely in a domestic context. I picked up that one of the big winners in the pandemic crisis in a business sense was Amazon, doing online, uh, online selling and buying and shopping. And the other big winners in the pandemic was FaceTime and uh, Facebook and Google. And they operate entirely in a decoupled time environment. When it comes to buying online, that opens up domestic law to international law. Which law applies in a contract? You'll do this in a, in a Jessup moot. In that sense, we it will decouple. Matters will arise 24 seven. They might be during working hours in one country, but there's something entirely different. More and more law firms to take business in this international context, we'll have offices around the world in different contexts, different time zones and so forth. So in that sense, there will be a decoupling of time. There's also a decoupling of time when we teach. In fact, the busiest time for our online students to use the internet to listen to their lectures is between midnight and 3 a.m. So in their lives, they've decoupled time. And why is that the busiest time? Because the families have been fed, the kids have been put to bed, the washing and ironing has been done, they have some spare time. <clears throat> and they do fear. So time is being decoupled in that context. In a traditional sense, though, 
Uh, no, well, we won't decouple. We'll have still have the traditional, uh, Jonathan, cultural impacts and imperatives that almost keep us in that uh, uh, less progressive zone. So that's me sitting on the fence. I hope I did give a bit of food for thought, Freddie. Now, Madam Chair, do you want me to answer the other questions which were put to me now? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Well, I think I'm going down to um, the culture as an ex-law student, et cetera, and the teaching law. law must not change. Law must always be supreme and absolute. But the time, I disagree with that. I think law must be seen as subject to change. It'll change because of legal interpretations. It'll change because of social pressure will cause the lawmakers to change and introduce new laws, which may require other laws to, uh, to be um, repealed. So law will change, particularly if society is the main driver of the law, and particularly if we have uh, judges who have a mind that although they only administer the law, they can offer opinion on the law. So I think law will change. It will change because of new technologies. For example, not so long ago, 25 years ago, there's nothing in intellectual property law in relation to the digital environment. Now it's full of it. We'll give you another example how law changes, and I'll use the United States as an example, if I may, and the debate and the controversy we have seen uh, occurring in the last 12 to 18 months or last three and a half years about the appointment of lawyers to the Supreme Court as to whether they will be conservatives or, or uh, neoliberalists or have some other label attached to them. And that in some respects indicates to me that law, at least in its interpretation by individuals can be dynamic. Now, do, I think that probably answers mine, does it not? Yes, I think it does. There you go. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor David Price for your response and for the next speaker. Mr. Jonathan Moore, please. Sure, uh, addressing the question about um, how do we make sure that culture doesn't change incorrectly? Um, I think that that's a, a real worry and I don't think that it's limited to Indonesia at all. Um, we are concerned about is our country going in the right direction whatever or whatever cultural group we're talking about. I think the key thing, um, and this comes with any form of interdisciplinary study is to approach it critically, um, to really be aware of the fact that if we accept that culture is going to change, and it does, um, even countries and people groups that are isolated, we still see change coming out of the results of um, drought or um, uh, um, the rise up of a particular leader with a particular leading style. Um, we see the culture change. To be aware that it's happening. Um, several years ago when I was working in Kenya, um, where there were no McDonald's, where there were no um, really foreign businesses whatsoever. Um, one of the men that I was working with, he could recite exactly what's on a Big Mac. He could tell you that there are, that there are two special patties um, on a sesame seed bun. And he'd never had a Big Mac and he asked, what's a Big Mac? His culture was being influenced by McDonald's and McDonald's wasn't present. It's going to change. Now being aware of the fact that we are being colonized by Nike or Adidas or um, McDonald's or KFC or K-pop, acknowledging that those things are being, are really actively influencing who we are and how we're seeing the world is the key. Um, we don't have the time to start discussing about um, cultural accommodations and talking about how individuals, groups and institutions can begin to go ahead and intentionally through the use of um, both codified rules but also just an attitude in which um, the entire group accepts as being appropriate, that all of those things change. But I think that you need to be aware of it. And that's the short answer, is to be aware that the culture is changing and be critical of, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? If we approach our culture as being absolute and being perfect, that's when we're going to be manipulated in a negative way. Um, I think that that hopefully answers it. Um, question number two, I don't know of an entire of an instructor at all who doesn't struggle with keeping students passionate. And this goes pre-pandemic as well. Um, what do you do with that one class in which 
people don't seem to want to talk or people don't want to engage. Um, the key thing is to be motivated yourself. And that means as an instructor, to be passionate about what you're teaching, even when you don't want to be passionate. Um, I currently teach a class that just finished up and it meets from Fridays from one o'clock in the afternoon until three o'clock in the afternoon. There's not a student on Ukaiswe's campus that wants to be in class from one o'clock until three o'clock on a Friday. And there are very few teachers who are gonna feel that way too. Um, I don't pretend to not struggle with that class, but I think that it helps from a teaching perspective to have that. But I think it also goes back to the interdisciplinary question. Can you help students identify what part of the subject does matter to them? And that may require them seeing the, the, the uh, course in a different way. And to say, listen, I know that you're not into the grammar. So let's not focus on the grammar of this particular English class, or you don't like this particular story. Let's focus on the character, or let's focus on this issue. Um, you don't like this type of law that we're covering. Where does this law overlap? Or does this type of over, law overlap? Or where is it going to evolve into? Finding students their hook, finding students the thing that they are personally going to be passionate about makes a big difference. Allowing students more opportunity to create their project in the way that they want to, giving them the flexibility of being able to focus their education in a unique way is also helpful. Um, when students are forced to write a paper in one way on one particular subject, they're going to be bored by it. And then um, the last question that I think that um, Dr. Price really did a great way of answering, um, and more than I could, I do think that laws change, and I do think that they should change. I think that speaking to that, it helps to look at the law from this um, transcultural perspective. When people talk about property, what are they really talking about? When we address the issue of um, the family, what is a particular cultural group really saying when they're identifying family or family values? Um, it helps, especially when we're dealing with multi-border scenarios um, to go ahead and look at things differently. Um, I know our university is pushing for more interdisciplinary courses. And I think that that helps as well to go ahead and allow us to see the law in different places. Next semester, I'll be teaching a class on home. And one of the things that we'll be bringing up is um, the issue of domestic law and how do we define home from a legal perspective. We'll look at literature, we'll look at anthropology, we'll look at psychology and gender roles, but we'll be covering all of these things in different ways. Um, it helps us to see the law through those other lenses. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan Hamar. And uh, for the last one, I would like to ask the I would like to ask the uh, Dear Francis Litai. Uh, but Theo, you mentioned that uh, the government has responded very well. Um, not uh, yeah, um, yeah, adequately to the to the change uh, when the pandemic uh, is was coming. But uh, what is the most difficult challenge for the government at the moment during the pandemic? Patel? I think the main challenge, uh, the main challenge is how to coordinate um, various uh, brands of uh, service provider uh, answering uh, the needs of people uh, during the crisis that come uh, came following the pandemic um, and while at the same time we also have to funnel the uh, ch channeling the budget to, to answer the uh, challenging issues in health uh, economic and uh, social security issue. Uh, those are three uh, fields that, uh, and, and now we, we are also, uh, uh, the, the government also face the, the challenge of uh, answering the need for economic, um, economic uh, recovery. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, that's that's the, the the main issues uh, 
right now for 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 the for the government at the same time uh, um, in 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 the in the in the light of uh, legal issues we also face the the challenge of um, now um, I think all all the countries in the world also face the same uh, challenge is to uh, bring people to observe the uh, health protocol in the public areas in order to limit the spreading of the spread of uh, or uh, virus and and, and we, we we discuss uh, this morning uh, with other groups about uh, public health law uh, that should uh, should be introduced uh, to the to the society and uh, and also uh, need uh, support from uh, experts from the universities uh, in order to introduce the the, the public health uh, a set of public health law system um, which is very well established in uh, Australia and US and uh, Taiwan and and uh, I, I uh, in, during the discussion this morning, I, I shared the story about uh, how Taiwan and Australia uh, dealing with the issue of uh, pandemic uh, by applying the uh, the new uh, the the public health law, uh, which uh, which is law actually, and uh, but you know we we have to label it as public health law in order to make people to aware about the importance of of the issue and, uh, and under the context of pandemic uh, yeah that's all even uh, thank you thank you and uh, I am afraid that I have to end the q and a session today due to the time but I, I am completely grateful to experience our thoughtful discussion today it was uh, very um, meaningful for me personally. But before I'll, uh, I end our uh, our whole sessions, please let me ask each speaker about their closing remarks. So please conclude uh, what you have um, uh, what you have probably you can resume up uh, your your materials. For the first one, please, Professor David Price. Probably only one or two minutes to wrap up your uh, your statement. Uh, right, you can hear me. Wrap up my statement, <laughs> which is an interesting question. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you want me to to do or say. So, in relation Maybe to the it's question, like a conclusion, or the or the conference as a whole. Yeah. Let me talk about the conference as a whole. I thought it was a tremendous uh, success. I enjoyed listening to both speakers. I didn't enjoy listening to myself, but I hope others did. But I thought it was a great afternoon. I enjoyed myself immensely. It was a very productive exercise. I am most grateful for the opportunity uh, to participate. And I thank my fellow alumnus and good friend, Puck Theo, for initiating the idea as he did. And I would say to you, have some more in the future because it's worth doing. We've hardly scratched the surface in this session. Uh, we could do so much more. There's a lot of issues that are raised, some in the questions. And I might say when it comes to international law, transnational law, the last two years in particular have been an absolute boon for any student that wants to study international law or transnational law. And I'll include, Jonathan, transnational and international cultures as well. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate. I'm most grateful. Thank you, Professor David Price. And the next one is uh, Mr. Jonathan Moore, please. Uh, again, I want to thank you guys for inviting the, the non-lawyer here to the group um, to let me be part of this. Um, and I learned a lot too. I really appreciate um, the comments both by, by David Price as well as the other speaker. Um, to, the, to the listeners and to the audience members, I want to encourage them. You are changing and your culture is changing. And especially the younger students, um, maybe not so much me and my generation. Um, you are part of this transcultural movement. You're bouncing between cultures in ways that your parents were not forced to and didn't necessarily enjoy doing it. 
if you're going to do it, I encourage you to look critically at the way that you're seeing the world, to understand that what you're studying goes far beyond law. Um, what you're studying is about family dynamics. What you're studying is about economics and colonialism. Um, what you're studying is about medicine and the other areas um, that you're passionate about. And so I encourage you to, to look for links between what you're passionate about and what you're studying, especially if those two things aren't immediately um, apparent to you, um, that you can make a career out of this, but to make a difference with it, it means seeing the world in a unique perspective, separating yourself out from the, the thousands of other law students throughout the world that are trying to do the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan. And our last speaker, Pat Theo. Yep. Uh, thank you, uh, pa, thank you, Buninon and uh, pa Jeff and pa Marihot uh, already invite me for this uh, opportunity. And um, I want to convey uh, um, happy Dies Natalis, uh, the 61 Dies Natalis of Faculty of Law. And uh, we are very lucky to meet uh, Professor David Price today. Uh, he is a very well-known uh, professor in uh, um, very different uh, uh, legal system uh, that uh, studied by him and uh, also working with uh, lawyers from all over the part of the world. So, yeah, I think we have to think about, we have to start plan about sending people to study and uh, with Professor Price in Darwin or conducting it through online program with uh, CDU and uh, UKSW. And uh, I think this is a very good opportunity. And um, Mr. Moore presentation is very inspiring for all of us and uh, teach us to be more open-minded and more, uh, you know, uh, think out of the box, uh, which is the, the, the need for us to success living in this uh, very plural, pluralistic uh, world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patio. And thank you so much for all of the speakers of final statement. And uh, please let me as a moderator to wrap up uh, the whole uh, conversations through this uh, academic event. So we cannot avoid that the pandemic, uh, the pandemic has occurred and it results, it has resulted many changes in many various uh, sectors, including in the field of the governments itself and also the education uh, sections. But the question is, uh, it, it raises, it raises the question of, do we need to adapt? And indeed, it is only a rhetorical question because we exactly know the answer. The answer is yes, we need to adapt. And in order, we, why we need to, to, to adapt to the change is that we need to improve our quality, especially in the service in education environmental. And I really hope that uh, the measure, the knowledge that uh, have been shared by the third all of the three speakers today will widen our uh, knowledge um, and help us to adapt how we adapt well in this uh, pandemic. Thank you very much for all of the speakers. And here we come as always, uh, again, I want to thank our speakers. I know that none of them have any time. They are completely overwhelmed or over demanded. And so we are very grateful uh, the time that you took to help us discussing this topic and responding to the participants' questions. And also I thank our faculty for holding this precious conference. And the last but not at least, uh, I thank all the participants for your presence and willing to attend this conference. Hope you have a great day and see you on the next academic event. Be safe, everyone. Thank you. Back to you, Alia. Thank you, Ms. Ninan, for turning this conference again. I would like to remind all of you to fill the exit ticket form that has been given through the chat column because only participants who have filled the exit ticket will get an e-certificate. So for next for now, I would like to announce 14 lucky participants who win the lucky prize in the form of book entitled Dignified Justice Theory by Professor Dr. Teguh Prasetyo as a MSE. And the winners are
So congratulations for the lucky winners. We hope it is useful for you. So right now, I would like to invite you to turn the camera on because we have entered the documentation session. Okay, so first slide. Second slide. Third slide. Fourth slide. Fifth slide. Sixth slide. Seventh slide. Eighth slide. Ninth slide. Tenth slide. And the last slide. So without further delay, it would be grateful to all of us to join a closing prayer. Let me invite Diofani to lead us in prayer. Um, take, take, uh, hang on. Okay, thank you, Alia. So our conference has ended. So let us once again come before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you at the close of our international conference to give you all our thanks and appreciation for all that has taken place today. Lord, we are grateful to everyone who contribute to the success of our conference by sharing with us their thoughts and professional expertise on different legal topics. Lord, help all of us to reflect and consider future of that we have heard today and whenever it is appropriate, enable us to use or put into practice the information and suggestion that was shared with us so that other my benefit. Lord, you know that we are living in difficult times because the coronavirus has cast a dark shadow over every nation. We pray that your glorious light will dispel this darkness and that live on earth will once again return to normal. In a post-pandemic world, help all of us to accept the many new legal challenges the and the opportunities which will undoubtedly confront us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity given to each of us to spend this time together with the help of modern technology in order to satisfy our desire for more knowledge and greater understanding Help us, Lord, to reflect on and apply to our own life the word of the psalmist David who said, Oh ho, I love your love. It is my meditation all the day. Lord, as we leave this conference, my each of us have a desire to pursue whatever opportunities might arise from our involvement in the field of legal education in an increasing digital environment. Bless us, Lord, and watch over us as we go our spread ways. In the name of Jesus, we offer you this prayer. Amen. Thank you. Um, I give back to Alia. Thank you, Giovanni, for the prayer. And we would like to express our gratitude to the speakers, also the panelists, respected Professor David Price, learned and international trainer and lecturer, also, Mr. Jonathan Moore and Mr. Teolita Ai for sharing expertise, ideas, and great learning. Last but not least, spend your previous time for us on this international conference to commemorate the 61st anniversary of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Satyawajana. We really appreciate them, and we hope to meet you again in another international conference in the near future. 
thank you as well to all of the participants who have been registered and attending with great enthusiasm. Also participate with interesting and important questions in this international conference. Thank you so much. Bye bye, thank you. Thank you, Professor David, Sir Jonathan, and Mr. Theo. Sir Jonathan and Mr. Theo Tai. Everybody. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Nino. Mrs. Nino. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. I enjoyed today. Can you send my regards to all friends in Darwin? Yeah, well, it's good to see you again. Yeah, see you again. And uh, hopefully, we, when we can all travel, yep. we'll get together either in Jakarta or back yes. here, but more likely in yep. Jakarta or even yep. in Salatiga. Yes. Yeah, bro. Don Jonathan, lovely to meet you online. Yeah, thank you, bro. I appreciate Very it. Nice. Lovely yeah. to see you. To yeah. and you. Yes. Thank you also. That's great expertise. And also, yeah. Mr. Moore, thank you very much. Right. Quite welcome. And we'll, we'll tie up any loose ends uh, via email. Yes, I will contact you uh, very soon yeah. through email, uh, okay. Professor. Yep. Thank you, bro. Well, well, I might, I might depart, but once again, thank you, everyone. I've enjoyed this afternoon. And as I said, let's do it again. Thank you, bro. Bye, bro. Thank Bye, you. bro. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Bye-bye. See you again. See you. Terima kasih, Sam. Terima kasih banyak. Yeah. Pak Marihot, Pak Duan. Terima kasih. Kita bisa bikin lagi yang lebih... Baik lagi. Ya. Ya. Luar biasa ya. acaranya. Ini 
langkah awal Mereka. yang luar biasa. Luar biasa. Thank you. Alia luar biasa. Operator luar biasa. Yeah. Terima kasih Pak. Teman-teman semua. Thank you for everybody in the committee. Fantastic job. Very good. <laughs> good job. Hai, hai, hai. Terima kasih semua. Yeah. Izin leave meeting ya. Thank you Bunin on.